Okay, so yeah, I, I was saying uh, I took a sec to get here because I was sitting in another server asking uh, Philosophy PhD whether he knew anything about L1 logic and he said he'd never heard of it and he got his logic book out and he's looking through his logic book and he's like, oh, I don't know what the fuck L1 propositional logic is supposed to be. And I was like, okay, cool, because I've never heard of it either, but well, all L1, I was saying to Grinch L1 now, isn't L1 isn't a logic. It's a it's decidability. <laughs> like you're not it's not like prop logic, we're just talking about the set of logics that can decide over propositional statements. I don't know why I'd be committed to like it being a prop logic or it being prop logic. The point of bringing up L1 is that I take it to be the decision procedure by which we can actually have a like valid complete and sound decision procedure over the set of propositions. Okay. So it grants us a model for consistency. Yeah, that well, that sounds like it's cool. Um, it doesn't sound like, however, that it is the only allowable system right, of I, logic available right, but, to you. But you know that you noted that I granted that in in chat, right? There, I, I didn't see that. Inf, there, there, there's actually an infinitum of decision procedures under prop logic. The problem with that is we can have decision procedures which are not going to be sound, are not going to be complete, and thus we need, if we want to have one that's going to be useful, we should be looking for one that is both complete and sound, which L1 is. And so what L1 does to achieve this is asserts a kind of equivalence relation between syntactical content and semantic content without moving to first order logic. And so in this setting, what we do is we say that each sentence has a singular truth value and each proposition refers to one sentence itself and only itself. So in that case, okay. what we can't do is something like <clears throat> P implies Q, R, therefore Q, and then just say, but what we meant by R is just P. No, 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 that's not what I said anyway. I didn't say what was meant by R was P. I said um, that P was P and R was what? R, but you just uh, said that because I repeated the proposition using different wording, that somehow wasn't the same proposition. And now you're that's, saying that's, that's, I'm that's, denied. That's, that's, you, that's you're, you're now saying that I'm denied <laughs> the ability to do this under L1 logic. And I'm saying, oh, well, that's great that you've got your L1 logic. logic. But I'm asking Not whether that L1 is the logic. exclusive under logic, logic allowable. Under prop logic, you can do that. But under that kind of um, view on the relationship between syntax and semantics, logic is going to fall apart fairly quickly. One of the ways that we might look at this very intuitively is if we start allowing those kinds of things in our decision procedure, it actually becomes fully undecidable. Um, you have a little bit of an interest in programming. And so what I'd ask you to do is what kind of program could you conceive of that if we gave it your exclusive, uh, like the argument that you gave, without a dictionary by which your proposition was asserted to be identical to the original proposition, how would it go about it determining that it's valid? Okay, well, I'll answer that question. But uh, before I do, I just want to say, as you've interrupted me um, a couple of times already, I'd, I'd say we have to speak uninterrupted. So if we take turns, that'll be great. So um, if I've just understood your question, you're asking uh, as a someone who is aware of um, programming, um, uh, I'm knowledgeable about programming. Uh, if, if I give, uh, in my understanding it correctly, if I give two different commands, um, it, it, is that going to have the same result? Or, or can, can I have inter interchangeable, multiple interchangeable different things which achieve the exact same um, uh, outcome? And I, I'd say absolutely you can. For example, if I wanted to increment a variable, I could do a plus plus increment. Whereas I could also do a equals a plus one. Right, that would but, be an example of increment. Right, but yeah. you understand that we're speaking meta linguistically here, right? And so what you can't do is just uh, answer my question in a way I already excluded you from doing. Because I uh, said you can't just have you, just, you can't just have some kind of thing that dictionarily equiv like uh, creates an equivalence between 
the two kinds of propositions, just like you would say there's an equivalence between plus equals one and plus plus. There is yeah. some kind of interpreter in the background that is going to actually compile those two statements to the same proposition. So it uses a dictionary of sorts. Now, you could do that in this case, but the problem with that kind of view on logic is that the way in which we would go about formalizing our system is we would have to conceive of every possible English sentence, and then we would have to equ uh, create an equivalent set of all the possible sentences that mean the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an extremely unparsimonious um, approach to formalizing a logical system. And so what we do instead is the kind of thing that's uh, given in like an L1 decision procedure, which is just to say that there is an equivalence relation between syntax and semantics, which is just to say that when I say P, I mean P, and when I say R, I mean R. And it's not the case that when I say P, I mean R. Um, because realistically, if you had answered my question sort of like I wanted you to, or as I had hoped you'd answer, you'd notice that... So... Sorry, I think I got out. Um, you, I think you would have noticed uh, that it, 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 it's actually an undecidable problem in, in mathematical logic and programming to offer any computer program a, like a natural language argument that uses things that mean the same semantically in natural language but are syntactically distinct without offering a dictionary and have it come to a certainty about the validity. It's an actually it's an undecidable. It's an undecidable state of affairs. Sure. Well, I'm I'm hearing a couple of things here. I'm I'm hearing you saying, "Oh, well, there's problems with that. We'd have to do this, and we'd have to do that, and this is a better system of dealing with it." But what I'm not hearing is L1 is the exclusive system of logic available to us, and it is so because of this case. And if I just remind well, you, well, the problem, uh, just posting the problem, now the problem, the problem in the... That, uh, don't, don't, yeah, interrupt, uh, the, don't interrupt me, man. I'm no, just the, posting the, now the, in the, in the, the general is, chat. Don't interrupt me, man. No, I'm talking. Um, I'm just posting now in the general chat. Uh, I said, in prop logic, they must be identical, Bryn. Is that your final position? Yes or no? And you said yes. So now no, you're it's, saying, it's, it's, now, it's now you're equivocating. No, now this is an equivocation, what you're doing now, Bryn. No, I still actually hold that because, um, I mean, sure, it might be antithematic, but the problem is, is that the decision procedure that you've sort of tried to put forward isn't going to be one that is complete or decidable. And so I'm not actually even sure that I would call it a logic. Um, what it more seems like is just, you're just equivocating between prop logic and natural language. I think for no, no. I think I think it's I think it's generally well accepted that when we talk about a formal logical system, which seemed to be what we were talking about, um, because the context wasn't just prop logic. I mean, again, if we take prop logic to be much more um, like definition diverse, <laughs> prop logic is going to refer to any kind of logical system or decision procedure over the propositions, which includes basically everything. Um, okay, so, so you're you're chuckling now because you know it's sophistry but, what you're saying. No, no, I'm chuckling. It's wiggling. Being, no, 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 I'm chuckling because you're being incredibly uncharitable. Because what we are no, no. clearly talking about in context, and your what your screenshot doesn't capture is that a Y and I were criticizing you for not having a formally valid structure. And under a formal system, what we need is something that is decidable and complete. So oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. Let, I, take, I, take, I, I want to stop you there. I, take, I, I want to stop you there. there want to be the decidable and complete. Deductive. Okay, Bren, I want to stop you there. I, w I, w I want to stop you there. I want to stop you there because you said that I didn't have a formal argument. Well, I did because I then um, demonstrated the validity and uh, I, I don't think I demonstrated the soundness, but I demonstrated the validity well, it actually, it actually of the argument. For other reasons, right? Because one of the propositions wasn't even a proposition. Or you, you, you are saying now, um, because of L1, my preferred way of doing things uh, this is invalid, but but no, that's not invalid objectively under any, it's not epistemologically uh, taken to be ob objectively the case that L1 okay, must so be before we, used before, all time. before we move forward, what I don't want you to start doing is getting into this mode where you start using words that you don't understand. Well, so, well, so, well so, what, so, what, so, what so, word do I, do I not understand? I mean, yeah. epistemological, well, I don't, I don't, in terms of the, yeah, the yeah, knowledge right. I don't of... Think, I don't think you actually understand what you mean by that sentence. Yeah, I do, and I can explain it. So in, in the literature, what we know about logic, the agreed uh, way of the agreed knowledge of the usage um, of 
uh, th these conventions. And you are now saying, oh, no, it's, it's now the case that uh, we have to use L1. Or who says that? Can you can you point me to a source? You, you pasted this PDF. Yeah, so, yeah, so, 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 you, so you, that, that, PDF that didn't from, that didn't actually back up what you were saying. PDF from, right, I showed you the PDF from Griffith and then the decidability stuff we could draw from like the Bulos book if you wanted to. Um, but the argument, I mean, look, the, the, the point is, is you're not actually giving me any kind of principled criticism of what I've said. Yes, I am. So far, all so so far, all you've sort of really begun to show is like that there's some kind of genealogical attack. Like this is because it's coming from me, or it's not coming from the experts. That it might be wrong. Um, I don't really take that to be a fair criticism. I think what I've shown to you is that when we look at what we need to properly call something a logic, it seems pretty pretty clear. Especially if we're talking about a formological argument, it seems pretty clear that what we would want to do is analyze that under a decision procedure that is complete and sound and that that's impossible in prop logic if we include the kind of stipulation that you're offering and so on that basis i think that we ought to instead epistemologically we should instead refer to something like l1 which is a decision procedure that is complete and sound and decidable okay uh, and, i hear and, what and, you're and, saying and, but... and in fact provably so and in fact is provably the most parsimonious way to do it so it's actually okay. it's it's actually the closest thing to approximating a simply prop logic statement okay so i hear that you're saying that it would be parsimonious i'm here hearing that you're saying that it would be beneficial and that's the way you prefer to do it but what i'm not hearing you say is here's the evidence for why it must be done this way in any objective epistemological sense uh, yeah, because if we followed your your view, we actually would be undecidable and uncertain about every argument. So sure, but that's actually, just an objection. So, 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 of, right, but that's but just an objection with the way you of doing you something. That, you understand that you understand that your view entails epistemological nihilism, right? No. Okay. Look, let's look look at it this way: if any proposition can properly refer, well, if any syntactical structure of any proposition can properly refer to any other view. The problem is, is that we actually can't be certain, except by assertion, of what any argument means. And so we actually wouldn't be able to conclude about anything because it's not decidable under any decision procedure. Uh, okay, cool. So, so let's go back to the first class of logic and take the proposition but we're not, as we're not, regnant we're not, look, and we're take in, the proposition. Not, it's, no, no, don't interrupt me. Look, don't don't look, in, look, interrupt look, me. Look, I, I don't interrupt you, Bren. Bren, I don't interrupt you. I don't interrupt you, Bren. I don't want to go down these... I don't, don't care. You I'm can giving, listen to what I'm saying. You're interrupting me. Look, I'm giving you the metallogical critique, and I'd like you to just... I don't care. Let me finish my sentence before you spring in. You can object to my sentence after you heard my sentence. You haven't heard what I'm saying. So if I just go back to what I was saying, if I say the proposition is regnant and I say the proposition it's raining, then the both of those things express the same semantic meaning. Es regnet means it's raining in German and it's, it's expressing the same thing, but with different words. But you're now saying that no, they cannot be expressed with different words. But this is literally like class one. <laughs> like This is such a basic thing that everyone will disagree with you here that the truth proposition of is regnant and it's raining uh, that are different because they're using different words that is a, a insanity like no one would that that's just wrong okay so I'll, I'll just i'll just return to my my original critique which again is like so so you're dodging what i just said you're ignoring what i just said no no because my critique is going to directly respond to that so if i have okay. the argument if i have the argument if um il pleut then it is raining, il pleut, therefore it's raining, or something like that, right? Like if I have some kind of point in my structure where I'm switching between two syntactic representations of the same semantics, could you offer me any kind of program that would be decidable without using a dictionary that could come up with the validity of the argument? And if, this, and if, you, and if you're unwilling or unable to present that, then I'm just going to retain my view, which is just that so far, the only system I've seen, which does offer decidability and completeness and soundness is 
the view that I presented originally, which is just that syntax has to remain consistent under a formal propositional logic. Okay, Bryn, you're, you're chuckling because you know what you're saying is, is no, really I'm not, I'm not, I'm not chuckling. Here. I mean, like this is actually this is actually my view, and this is actually, I mean, a relatively important part of contemporary logic because okay, that that can be your view, but but what are you now disagreeing, Bryn? Is it the case that you are now disagreeing with the fact? that it's regnet and it's raining do not express the same truth claim, truth proposition. Is that your claim, that they do not express the same semantic? I think without a dictionary, it's undecidable. <laughs> okay, okay then, Bryn. I think, I think I, I've got what I've come for here now. Okay, um, but, I mean, okay, so, if that so, is your so, view, so, then, so, <laughs> then I can... So look, the, the problem is, is just that if we're inside of like some kind of, um, if we're in, inside, within some kind of argument there is some way which we can abstract from the logic and we can return to like a natural language statement or we can start talking in terms of assertion statements now the problem with that is that that might be somewhat logically nihilistic that might actually be meaning nihilistic and in fact if we were to follow wittgenstein on this our view would be that actually there is no such thing as a formally valid propositional logic argument the problem is, is that if we want to rescue logic against these kinds of critiques that I'm offering, what we have to do is give up some degrees of freedom. And one of the degrees of freedom we can give up is uh, the ability to waver syntactically. And so what L1 offers is just the equivalence relation between syntax and semantics under our model of completeness. The problem, like the view, the view is, is just like as as we sort of explored logic more, um, this notion of proofs as programs has evolved quite a bit, and I think that you've sort of realized that there's no decidability for your argument without a dictionary. Wait, uh... so the validity can't be checked. Uh, so, so I just, I just want to return to what you said. Uh, previously, I didn't want to interrupt you, so I'll let, let you finish. But um, you said that uh, Wittgenstein said that uh, truth propositions um, cannot be true or cannot formally be true. What was that that you said exactly about Wittgenstein and truth propositions? Well, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's view is that um, <laughs> words don't actually carry any meaning. Um, there isn't actually anything properly like semantics, at least not something that's accessible in any kind of dialogue. And so okay, so, so when I say- in, in is assertion statements. So what follows from Wittgenstein's view is just something that, um, is it, like the, the view on Wittgenstein just is something like that prop logic, a prop logic collapses into something like a natural language anyways. And we can certainly take that view. Um, but if we took that view, it would actually still just result in your, your argument being invalid. What I'm trying to do is create something that is at least a little bit more charitable and tries to show that there are certain decision procedures which are programmatic and which can actually result in concluding whether or not your argument is valid. Now, the problem with that is we just have to give up some degrees of freedom. And one of those degrees of freedom is the ability to syntactically waver. Okay, so when Wittgenstein says this is a very pleasant pineapple, what does he mean by that? It, it's, in my view, it's inaccessible. So, so you, you have no idea what he's saying by it? I mean, I don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't actually believe in, in, in semantic meaning. I think that's besides the point, though. The, the point just is, is that if we're looking at a formal logic, what we're talking about is something that contains a model for completeness, and then a decision procedure, which can operate over that model to determine completeness and also soundness. Now, the problem is, is that if we allow in our model for these kinds of syntactical relations where we can say premise P just is premise R, then without a dictionary, we're not going to be able to decide that. But if we include a dictionary, We'd have to do that for the entire set of sentences, which is, <laughs> I think, just going to be an infinite set. I don't think there actually is a way to decide over that either for different reasons. And so to create okay. something that actually is decidable, 
that's why we have something like L1, which just restricts this. Okay, so uh, I've heard a lot of rambling, but I haven't really heard a lot of addressing the core problems. And now you've raised up something about Wittgenstein, which uh, I think indicates you don't actually know what you're talking about when it comes to Wittgenstein. Um, and he responded in a weird way when asked you the, the very, very well-known classic pineapple um, question, Wittgenstein, and you failed pretty hard on that. So I'm starting to think now that you're just name-dropping Wittgenstein, not really understanding uh, what is the case there. So uh, just e even in the, the well, I'm, tractatus, I'm just, I'm just you, in, I'm in just the tractatus, look, look, what, what look, is the look, case oh, the fact is okay, the existence so of atomic here's, facts? Here's the, here's, here's the problem. I don't accept the tractatus. Um, I'm referring to what follows from Lemma 201, through to lemma 256 in the philosophical investigations which is just the sure. disproof of what is presented in the tractatus yeah sure but that, the tractatus that's, 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 that's why i responded the tractatus. to what i did look, no 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 look that, that's the way I, that's why i responded to what i said uh, to what you were referring to i'm aware of the pineapple conjecture um the view that wittgenstein is trying to present when he talks about very pleasant pineapples is just to show the mental image view of semantic content now the problem with that kind of view of course is what is presented in the philosophical investigations following lemma 201 and the rule following paradox so what i mean when i say wittgenstein is that i refer to what appears to be wittgenstein's later uh, interpretation of semantic content and the view he sort of retired on which just is that there isn't such thing as true semantic meaning and that he is overall skeptical of the analytical project, which is why after publishing the philosophical investigations, he sort of turned his back on philosophy. Now we can talk uh, about, okay, we can talk well, about Wittgenstein all you want. I mean, I have both the Tractatus and the PI right here. We can start pulling out the lemmas and go. Okay, lemma, sure. Lemma. Well, yeah, uh, okay. Maybe, 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 I, was, maybe I, was, I was quick to judge that. It, it just you responded the first time around in a bit of a weird way. And I was like, I responded, okay, I responded the way Wittgenstein would respond if he was alive. No, 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 you didn't, man. You didn't. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, mean, you, I mean, look. look now, now I'm more reassured. I, I'm now reassured that you know what you're talking about if you've got a copy of the Tractatus and a lot of logical um, invest, uh, the, the philosophical investigations right with you there. there no, then I, I'm now reassured. Actually, that you it do actually know is what you talk proof about. in the Tractatus Callus. Um, well, they are they are hierarchical aphorisms, yeah, but there are actual proofs and lemmas. Um, in the Tractatus is actually included one of um, Wittgenstein's attempts at a, a rigorous proof of um, addition, which he well, look, 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 man, well, let, let, let's not than, let's not let's not yeah, spiral yeah. off to Pluto here. What I was trying to say when I mentioned the Tractatus, I'm not saying that that was his, uh, how he, he left it um, b before he died. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the posthumous work, sort of, uh, it's a refutation of the, the Tractatus to a certain extent, but it's not a, a, a complete refutation of everything that he'd ever written in the Tractatus. He's, it, he's refuting certain elements of it, for example, the, the, the picture element of it, that propositions are like pictures. Uh, some people disagree that he actually made an improvement there and the, the picture idea was actually had something to it, but that's beside the point. What I was getting at is that uh, the, the analytic tradition that Wittgenstein was contributing to had at its core truth propositions. And whether it was the philosophical investigations, his later posthumously published work, or the uh, earlier work, it, it is sort of irrelevant to a certain degree. Um, when you started saying that um, he, Wittgenstein, somehow didn't think that there was any, uh, uh, you, you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't have a truth proposition, or I don't know exactly what you said. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but then I was just like, you're trying to debunk something by referencing Wittgenstein when Wittgenstein doesn't even believe that himself. So uh, that that's where we were going on Wittgenstein. Um, would you do you want to concede uh, re retract what you said about true statements, or can you no, clarify no, exactly no, no, what you were saying? No, 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 I'm not going to concede anything. I think if I listened back to the recording, I would agree with everything I've said. Okay, um, can, can you be more clear of what you meant about the truth proposition? Yeah, 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 Wittgenstein? Vi yeah Vic Wittgenstein's view just is that um, due to the failure of any language to capture uh, semantic content, that there actually isn't going to be any valid argument there just isn't meaning in language and so if there isn't any meaning in language um except in the cases 
where we're talking about a purely syntactic decision, there actually isn't such thing as a valid or sound argument. Yeah, I, I just don't really, uh, and, unless I've missed that, in, are you saying that is something exclusively derived from his later work, or you're saying that is something that was also yeah, I present that's, throughout? I think that's, I think that's derived um, from, from 138 through 242 and is most properly demonstrated in 201 in the PA. But we don't even okay, need to appeal to Wittgenstein. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly just appealing to like my current views on model theory and decision procedures and logic. And I pointed out numerous times in this debate how the kind of system that you've presented is undecidable. And so we wouldn't actually be able to demonstrate any validity in any argument under your view. Um, whereas what I've offered to you actually does give us a decision procedure that can determine the validity. And so I'm happy with okay. that. Okay. So are you refusing to accept that there's synonymity between um, words in language? So for example, if I said the trash can is red, the bin is red, the garbage can is red or whatever the fuck you say in America, um, those three things, as far as I'm aware, are synonymous. Well, would you say that there's actually uh, a semantic difference of, of any kind between those three propositions? Um, under my view, yes. But I think that even if I'm going to be charitable to you and say something like those do carry the same um, referent, the problem is, is that that might not be available to us. And so there's even a further pragmatic objection, which just is that... Um, we really ought not use synonyms in the cases of delivering an argument just so that it can be clear what we're talking about. Um, but again, I mean, this is still going to have the exact same problem where without a dictionary structure, this system is going to be undecidable. So I think both from the fact that there's a pragmatic objection here and there's a methodological objection here, I don't really think that there's much to be said for your case. It seems like if we're talking about a formal classical logic, um, yeah, it, it, there doesn't really seem to be much reason to hold your view. Okay, so um, I just want to go back to basics here. So we've got two analogies uh, on the table. We've got the computer programming analogy, which I just want to go back to a second that you brought up earlier. So you're saying... Well, it's not just an analogy. That when I just to be clear, it's not actually an analogy. I'm, I'm actually, when I talk about that, I'm, I'm talking about a concept that's relatively popular in philosophy right now okay. called the Curry-Howard correspondence or proofs as programs. And so okay, cool. It's, well, it's, so it's, 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 actually, it's actually a part of our meta logic. It's not just an analogy. The, okay, the well, point I, is, the I point, don't the care about just, whether it's an analogy. It, yeah, the, the point I, I was just going to go back to it. So, so can we a, just go a, back to it? I don't care if it's an analogy right. or a concept. Right. Let, let's go. Let's go back to that. Revisit that quickly. So, if I've got a plus plus, and then I do another line of a plus plus, versus another computer program, which is a equals a plus two, are you saying that the computer program will look up those functions and implement those changes? in the same way into machine code. So it will compile it into machine code in the same way. So the machine code would look identical to whether we had A++, new line, A++ versus A equals A plus two. Yeah, so um, in modern compiler theory, yeah, those actually probably would compile down to the same thing. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Even if they didn't though, I mean, like if they didn't, that would be a problem for you. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the, the point is. Well, no, look, um, as far, as far as my awareing, um, my, my awareness of machine code goes reversing machine code into assembly and looking at assembly and you're looking at like the, the J and E's and the J E's and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can, you, you can quite clearly see that multiple different operations come out, um, like with different results. So the, the A++, A++, that is equivalent to what I'm doing with A equals A plus two. But actually where it's different lines of code, I am not gonna say that it won't be compiled in an identical form, but I'm skeptical that it would be. 
because it, they're, they're two different versions of code. So there would need to be, and it, it would depend on the language, but there would need to be an additional layer of interpretation and uh, a code, uh, a type of like code compression in order to com condense and compress stuff down uh, into, because if that was the case, that it just automatically made your code more efficient and automatically made your code tidier, then you wouldn't, need to be neat with your coding so and you wouldn't need to optimize your code because it would just self-optimize everything so I, i'm i'm very skeptical that that would actually be the case i mean that's that is actually how modern compilers like gcc and icc work um they do use a lot of machine learning-esque principles and a lot of code compression um but i think that's sort of all besides the point which again just is that um, getting into those kinds of disputes about syntax structures is irrelevant when um, what we're talking about is like a formal classical logic and just the fact that there is no way to show that what you have said is valid without a dictionary structure. Now, if you want a dictionary structure, that's fine. But on some levels, that's not going to be propositional logic anymore. That's going to be some kind of higher order logic on another level um i think it's just not going to be parsimonious and so it'd be better just to reduce it down into l1 and then on another okay. level too there's just a clear pragmatic objection which just is is that if you're being unclear about what you're talking about um in any in any case there's a pragmatic objection there um if you're switching in between il pleu and um it is raining halfway through a sentence, it can be extremely unclear that you've actually delivered the same meaning there. And so this is part of why, um, I mean, I've, I've offered you the very formal way for why we need this, but even just speaking intuitively, talking about the human computer, there we can create more and more abstract cases where this will become more and more problematic, where the more and more you use complicated language, the less and less clear it will be that you're referring to the same thing, up until the point eventually where um, it allows for an equivocation upon certain statements, or that we wouldn't actually be able to determine between the validity of any given argument based on the level of charity we would need to provide. The problem is that for any case where um, the syntax of P and R is distinct, but the claim is that they entail the same thing semantically. Um, what you what you need to um, understand is that <laughs> you're just adding confusion to the conversation. There's just no need for that. Okay, so you've said a few things there. You've said um, that GCC does that yeah. uh, code compression that it's more parsimonious to use uh, the exact same words that it's unclear not to use the same words and um you, you've, you've said that is we'll be unable to determine the val validity easily if we didn't use the same words just from the semantic meaning alone so i'm going to address all those things now so uh the first thing when you said that gcc um compressed code that's actually uh wrong because gcc is a collection of compilers um under the gunu project from like linux or unix or and um so the it, that, that that's got like multiple languages in it so you, you you've not just got c you've also got like fortran and shit like so it, yeah what and, you said yeah, there i think you're just pulling out your ass I'm, but um I'm but anyway the, the parsimonious thing I'm, I'm, no 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 like i the problem is I've, I've done significant work with both compiler theory and working on projects like the gcc and so i'm aware that um in things like g plus plus and the fortran extensions for gcc that these kinds of optimizations actually also occur. Um, there's various algorithms and ways to actually do cross-language compilation optimizations. Um, and in fact, in some cases, there is compilation into C, which is then compiled down into machine code, for example, um, or just in any case where uh, we have some kind of theoretical performance benefit, say from unrolling loops or whatever, um, these things are implemented in each different compiler, but even but even yeah. then, even then, I think that that's sort of being uncharitable at all because I think that um, yeah, under under modern compiler theory, 
these kinds of optimizations are pretty pretty standard, and I think that you should probably just grant that. I mean, um, yeah, yeah, I, I know that there are optimizations, but if you're telling me that spaghetti code magically gets transformed into efficient efficient code, then you're you're just in cloud cuckoo land, dude. <laughs> like, I might as well just you could just like fire any coders <laughs> who who are working for you and just like employ Fiverr coders <laughs> to come in on your project if that's the case just to write spaghetti code because um, but that's man like that's that's not true though um the yeah, yeah well, obviously we can't just get people on fiber that was an exaggeration no, but you know what i mean that we, yeah, like we the, can't just the, have the, spaghetti code magically being uh turned into this most most optimized code yeah, just that no. uh, magically by the the problem the problem with imperative programming is that um it's very easy for certain programs to create directives and imperatives that the compiler is going to be unable to reduce. And so, I mean, that's, that's its own other separate problem from the problem of reduction. But I think in these very trivial cases where we're talking about, um, well, even, I don't even know if it's just in the trivial cases. I think that generally speaking, compilers are a lot more add up than you'd grant them. And I think that given sufficient computing power and um, compiler theory that actually it would be possible. Um, well, actually, I think it's only going to be possible in certain languages now that I think about it. Because now I'm thinking about um, certain cases with like the halted problem. But I think that's besides the point. Um, in any case, the the view is just sort of is just sort of twofold, which is just that if we're talking about a um, a decision procedure for propositional logic the view in which we have this equivalence relation between syntax and semantics um, is a degree of freedom that we give up to reach completeness and soundness. Um, and so there's, a, there's an epistemic virtue there. And then on this much more applied or pragmatic level, it's just an intuition pump to see that if what we're granting is that people can just mean the same things by these structures, in many cases, we have to either already have a dictionary by which we can relate those concepts, or alternatively, um, we'd have to ask for clarification. And so just in terms of the meaning intention, we're going to fail to follow through with the meaning intention. And so I'm not sure that I'd properly grant that as valid either. I think that generally speaking, if we're talking in an argument form and we're talking about a formalized valid structure, we just have to point, like we just have to accept that you have to be as clear as possible, pragmatically speaking. Okay, so you, you've said a bunch of things there. Um, so some of the things on the table currently is that um, it's virtuous or it's parsimonious um, or it's it's uh, clearer um, to, to use the same uh, syntax um, for a proposition rather than a similar um, semantic meaning. Um, okay, I can grant all of that. I, I can grant that all day long, but I'm not going to grant you the fact that uh, it's necessary. It's somehow required or entailed uh, insofar as if you, you, if, if you write anything as a propositional uh, logic argument that you, you somehow are forced into using um, these conventions. I'm saying these conventions are good. Yeah, maybe it is clearer. Maybe it is more personal. Maybe it is more Maybe I'm not being clear thing. enough other systems just aren't decidable okay so so that's the second contention so the first contention is that it would somehow have merit so i'm going to grant you that it's gonna it's going to be better to use the, the the same um exact same syntax i'm gonna i'm gonna grant that because uh yeah we can agree on that but then you're now saying that if we don't use the same syntax then we somehow now magically need to ask clarification and it somehow magically now will be invalid until we somehow pass it into uh, back into identical syntax and that's just nonsense if if i if i said for example i'm just taking the quote that i gave you earlier with the marginal cases if marginal uh, humans have moral status so do some non-human animals some non-human animals have moral status we understand that completely i don't need to ask anyone to clarify that i don't need to ask about the meaning i've got that i i can understand that perfectly so what, why am I now somehow obligated to do that instead of it just being virtuous to do?
Yeah, because um, so <laughs> if we're looking at it programmatically again, um, there's going to be no concrete decision procedure there. So one thing that I could point out is that in the case of the argument about AMC, um, it wasn't that the actual words were being used. It wasn't synonyms being used. It was that the sentence structure was changing. The issue with that is you'd only be able to use something like an algorithm to determine similarity of sentences there. Um, and so even in that case, you're not going to be able to determine deductive validity. You'd be able to have like some kind of really strong induction um, based on like some kind of linguistic view. Um, but again, strictly speaking from like a formal classical logic, I don't, I don't know that that's decidable. And so that's a pretty significant problem to granting that that is a valid argument um, under an FCL. Now, if the argument is something like um, under our ability to interpret natural language or our ability to determine uh, to determine what's being said under an English system, that's fine. But now we're no longer talking about FCL. We're now talking about um, FCL plus some kind of interpretation schema, and. I don't think that that's, that's going to work well for your view. Um, okay, so if we, let's just get to the nitty gritty and bring up an example. So I've just written something a bit silly, uh, unsound off the top of my head, but um, just to um, it, get an example up. So if Bryn likes eating, then he won't go hungry. Bryn likes eating food, so he won't go hungry. So, um, so there, uh, in one case you like eating and the other you like eating food um like for for, for me the the process of eating if i say eat food and then i then repeat it by saying eating then we know that we're talking about eating food right and unless i, I say that oh no he's now not eating food he's eating something else or uh, he's eating sand or something uh, we can just assume that um you're eating food if the argument is about eating food or are you going to say, no, I'm so confused, but it's got confused, and I just can't understand that? Well, I'm not, I'm not confused because the problem is, is I can make assertions about what you're saying. Um, I mean, I have this kind of community of engagement that we've gone through. Um, I, I understand you to be like a, a relatively um, uh, consistent actor in your usage of language. The assertion that I can provide is that you've used those things in the same sense in each case, but it's not going to be itself formally valid. So that that is going to be invalid because I change a word or or that it's got the same syntactical meaning, but it's now invalid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. okay, so okay, let, let's let's just um, I'm just going to give you one final example. And then we can do closing statements. Like, like, the, 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 the problem is, is you you understand right how like you've even admitted in that in that structure there are clear interpretations of eating that can result in that being invalid, and that's that's a significant problem for the view. Um, like if we're not talking strictly about the same thing that is a significant problem. And we can't, we have at least, there's a pragmatic argument that it's at least less assertable. And then there's this further like formal view, which is that it's actually just undecidable. Um, the first is I think all that we need to do to ask for people for clarification. We just need to like point out that there's an easy equivocation here. And I think the second is much more rigorously what I meant by my like much more like structured view of logic, which just is that um, these sort of like very naturally uh, these very like natural language interpretive views on logic or these very intu intuitionistic views on logic are just very problematic for various reasons, especially because like any programmatic procedure over them is just going to be impossible. Uh, you, you're you're just cutting out, man. I I don't know. Uh, I, I heard that it's 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 better to uh, use the same syntax, and then you just like yeah, okay. it. yeah. So just just to make it short again, I think that the the point just is is that um, 
it, all I all we really need to ask for clarification is just to point out that um, that there's some level of ambiguity here, which you've already acknowledged. In which case, like we already have to ask the question: What did you mean by that? Um, in some cases, that uh, disclarity is going to be significantly less, and we can just make assertion statements and just move on. Um, but under like any kind of formal system, we're not going to have the ability to programmatically determine validity. And that's a significant issue, which is why I take this like much more structured view of what our model for completeness and validity should look like. Okay. So then I'd say closing statements would be, um, you're trying to establish that it would be better. Uh, it would be advantageous and you think for some reason um, it's it's so problematic using different syntax uh, that it actually renders the argument invalid. Right. And right. I'm saying, uh, I'll just give the last example. Uh, we've covered this, so you don't really need to even respond to this. This is in my closing statement. But um, it, it, if I have an argument such as, if the German weatherman says, es regnet, then I will get wet. The German weatherman says it's raining, therefore I'll get wet. Um, it's the same, uh, it's the same semantic meaning. Um, and anyone who knows the words es regnet in German knows that means it's raining. So there is no confusion, there's no ambiguity, there's no, uh, ah, it's now invalid. And anyone who says that, so Brin's saying, that an argument would be invalid because the propositions um, es regnet and it's raining are different truth claims or they're so different or they're so, the, the, the semantic meaning is somehow different enough that the argument's invalid. Whereas that is a very fringe position. Um, if you read any textbook on like entry level philosophy and logic and stuff, uh, you'll see this listed an example. So, so the reason why I said the is regnet, it's raining example is because it's literally one of those hello world, very first introductory level examples, which is frequently used. So for Bryn to now turn around and say, no, that's wrong, that would be invalid. He's just, it's a very, very, very fringe position, which almost everyone who has just got a basic grasp of logic would disagree with. So that's where I'd say we stand on this particular matter. We've actually got another matter that we were debating about um, conceding another point, but that could be for another debate. But for this debate uh, about the uh, syntax and semantics of propositional statements, I'd say that Bryn has an extremely fringe view and he's entitled to that view, but I'm not obligated to his view. So yeah, that was my statement. So Bryn, if you'd like to go ahead. I think I already delivered my final statement, so I'll give you the last one. Okay, cool, man. Okay, well, it was nice talking to you then, and I guess that's it.